So from this passage, we see uh, the grand objective, the grand goal of God's purpose in the dispensation of the fullness of the times is that everyone will be united in Christ. And uh, this is a glorious truth, and we need to keep this in mind as we look at the various threads uh, through which we're going to have to travel when we're thinking about the nation of Israel and the church and the kingdom and the relationship of each. So we, we want to think about Israel past, present, and future, and this is a huge topic, but it's an important one, and it's a blessed one. Now, the little nation of Israel today is about the size of the state of New Jersey. It's in the news every day. And uh, when we think about this little country, about 74% of the people there are Jewish, uh, about 7 million, and about 21% are Arab, about 2 million. Now, that doesn't include um, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. In, in the Gaza Strip and West Bank, there are another 5 million Arabs. So all told, um, there are about 15 million people in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. About half of them are Jewish and half of them are Arab. And uh, when we look at this subject, there will be some divisions, some, some different opinions about these things. But I want you to know that there are a lot of opinions among the Jews themselves. You know, uh, since 1948, the Jews who have a, a parliamentary system have never had a majority government. They have 30-something parties, and they say that if you have uh, five Jews in a room, you have six opinions. So it's not like Christians have to endorse everything the nation of Israel does, because the Jews themselves don't endorse everything the nation of Israel does. And we're going to have to make a clear distinction between Israel as it's discussed in Scripture and the nation of Israel as it is today. Today, Israel is largely a secular country. Now, many of the leaders there are, um, are atheistic. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't even believe that Abraham existed, many of them. They don't believe in the Exodus. Uh, they're minimalists when it comes to biblical history. And so um, we don't feel obligated to uh, endorse everything that goes on in the nation of Israel. However, we do believe that there is a future for Israel as the Bible discusses it. And we're going to try and make some of those distinctions uh, with you today. So in our first session, I think one of the most important things is to understand the names and the categories and the definitions. If we get that correct, uh, we're halfway to the finish line. So let's go back right to the beginning. In the beginning, there was just one race, the human race. The Apostle Paul, when he speaks at Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 26 and 27, he says this, And he, that is God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. All right, so one blood, every nation uh, carries a common blood. You can take the blood out of one um, group of people and put the blood, that blood into another group of people, and it works because everyone has been, um, the traces their, their origin back to Adam. Everyone is, uh, uh, we have borne the image of the earthy. We are related to Adam, and that includes Jews and Gentiles. Well, then number two, God selected one man and his family to be set apart from all the others. And it's important to understand why. God selected Abram, and we can read about this in Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is obviously a pivotal moment in, in the history of the world. And when we think about um, God's purpose, uh, the scripture tells us that uh, he raised up the nation of Israel as a divine protest against the common view that had been disseminated around the world that the universe, the world, was run by impersonal forces working on mindless matter. So you have um, worshiping the sea god and the fertility goddess and so on. And God was saying, no, there is a real person behind the universe who wants a personal relationship with you. God is a people person and he wants a relationship. And um, so the, the religions of the world had devolved into techniques to try and control the forces of nature for their own advantage. And God said, that is not the way to live. And so he took Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he brought him into the Middle East, into the, the land we now call Israel. And he his intention was, the reason he selected Abraham was because he said, I know him that he will guide his children after him. I'm looking for a missionary family who will take the message of the one true God and spread it throughout the world. That was his intention. Now, um, through this nation, we read, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In spite of Israel's intransigence and their failure in many points, it's also true that the three greatest blessings that have ever come to the human race have come through the nation of Israel. And these three, of course, are the scriptures and the Savior and the Spirit. The Spirit was promised to the nation of Israel in Joel 2 and fulfilled at Pentecost, where they were all Jews. And so these three spectacular gifts that we'll never understand how blessed we are to have them came to us through the nation of Israel. Now, point number three. Abram was not a Jew, all right? He's described as follows in Deuteronomy 26, verses 4 and 5. Uh, when when um, you bring the first fruits of the offering, the Lord said, when you come into the land and you begin your harvest, take the first fruits and bring them to me, and this is what I want you to say. My father was a Syrian. Some translations have Aramean, about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. All right, in one sentence, in God's uh, wonderful style, uh, economy of words, he describes this history of a man who was not a Jew. He was taken out of um, Iraq. Um, on the shores of the Euphrates River, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, surrounded by idolatry, and after a detour to Haran, he was brought into the land of Canaan. And from there, God began to establish his purposes in spreading this blessing to the whole world. Now, by and large, here's what happened. Uh, a family went down to Egypt. A nation came out of Egypt. This nation was not missionary-oriented, right? Some of the famous stories that have to do, for example, with Jonah, who was unwilling to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He wanted them to perish. And likewise, Peter, um, hundreds of years later, called the son of Jonah, a different Jonah, of course, also at Joppa, did not want to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he needed this, this uh, object lesson of a tarpaulin coming down from God out of heaven to convince him that Gentiles should not be considered unclean and that God wanted to save them too. 
And therefore, through the centuries, because the Jews were reluctant missionaries, God used a different tactic. They were, of course, sinful. They turned away from him. But there was still always a remnant of believers among them. And so God actually allowed Gentile nations to take Israel into captivity. And they would bring with them their scriptures and their God. And then he would cause a crisis to develop or allow a crisis to develop in that empire, which would force a showdown between the local gods and the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible would be proven to be the true God. So whether it was with Joseph in Egypt or later Moses in Egypt, with Daniel, with Esther, uh, all of these stories have to do with a a, a conflict, a battle between the local gods, who were no gods at all, and the God of the Bible. And even men like Nebuchadnezzar would write a testimonial and send it throughout his empire of 120 odd um, provinces from India to Ethiopia. And he would proclaim the message that the, the true God is the God of the Jews. And, the, and largely, this is what happened with the church as well. They didn't want to scatter. They didn't want to take the message. They all wanted to stay in Jerusalem. And the Lord, using Saul of Tarsus before he was even saved, caused the dispersion of the Jews and with them the Christians who were spread throughout the empire to take the gospel to the world. We're still reluctant missionaries. The word that's used to, to pray for God to send out missionaries, the word is to thrust them. The word is used, describes the dislocating of a, of a shoulder. That, that, that's, he's got to twist our arms to get us to take the message to the world. So we shouldn't be too hard on the Jews because we have the same feeling. It's hard enough for us to cross the street to talk to a neighbor, let alone cross the world with the gospel. All right. So Abram uh, was not a Jew. What was he called? Well, initially, as we see, he was called a Syrian or an Aramean or a Chaldean, uh, this region south of the Tigris-Euphrates uh, river valleys in, in Iraq. Uh, but later on, he's called a Hebrew, an Hebrew from the word Hibaram, which means uh, to cross over or across the river. And sometimes that me meant the Euphrates River, but sometimes it meant the Jordan River. And so here was a man who had left his home and loved ones and had traveled to this land and crossed the river. And of course, there's a great deal of symbolism in this, this idea of crossing the river, as we see when the nation of Israel crosses the river, when Elijah and Elisha cross the river, when the Lord Jesus crosses the river. All of these um, symbols are wrapped up in this concept of a Hebrew. Um, later on, then we have the name of Israel. Now, this is quite complicated. You've got to keep your, your brain in gear here. But after Jacob wrestled with, with the God-man at the fords of Jabbok, that's in Genesis 32, his name was changed to Israel, meaning prince with God. And, uh, and so sometimes when we read the name Israel, uh, it's referring to Jacob, and specifically Jacob in his spiritual desires. Uh, sometimes the name goes back and forth. Sometimes he's called Jacob if he's misbehaving, and, uh, and sometimes Israel. Um, then uh, not only the man Jacob, but also uh, the whole nation is called the nation of Israel. Uh, that is the 10 tribes, or the, pardon me, the 12 tribes and Levi who came from Jacob, right? Jacob's sons and grandsons, two grandsons, Jake, uh, Joseph's boys, um, it, it, the whole nation is called Israel. Then, after the division of um, the kingdom, after the united kingdom of Saul and David and Solomon, the kingdom was divided in the days of Solomon's foolish son Rehoboam, and Jeroboam took 10 tribes to the north, and they became known as Israel. So there, Israel is being referred to as those 10 tribes. However, when they 
finally were restored when the remnant came back from Babylon and reestablished the land, once again, the whole nation is referred to as Israel. <clears throat> then we discover that um, the Lord Jesus is sometimes referred to as Israel. This is especially true in the servant songs in the book of Isaiah. He is the true prince with God, and he represents the, the whole nation. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and sometimes is referred to as Israel. Um, finally, uh, when we come to the New Testament, um, Israel is sometimes, I know this is complicated, sometimes the word Israel refers to um, the, the whole agglomeration of Jewish people. Sometimes it refers to the remnant of Jews who will believe, as in, for example, quote, all Israel will be saved. Now that is referring to about one third of the Jews. Two thirds of the Jews, according to Zechariah, have sided with the anti-Messiah and they have been annihilated. And so only those Jews that have survived, who have hidden away down in uh, Southern Jordan, Northern Saudi Arabia at, at Basra, um, where the Lord Jesus comes and rescues them and brings them back. Uh, these are the words, uh, who is this that comes from Edom, from Basra, his garments dipped in blood. This is referring to this remnant who discover that Jesus is the Messiah they've been waiting for. And uh, in the words of Isaiah 53, they say, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. And they receive him as personal savior. And so um, uh, this is the fulfillment, of course, of Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. A nation is born in a day. And, and the Lord uh, restores uh, his ancient people, Israel. So um, when in Galatians 6, 16, we read about the Israel of God, that's referring to Jews who are truly saved, right? Paul says, I am a Jew. And he uses the term Israel of God to refer to Jews who are believers in the Lord Jesus, who have received Christ as their Savior, not simply as their Messiah, but as their sin bearer. And that's uh, crucial to understand the difference. So uh, this term Israel can be used for a lot of different things. One, one thing it should not be used for is to use the term, which is non-biblical, spiritual Israel, to say that the church is spiritual Israel. This is a this is an unfortunate turn of phrase. We shouldn't use it because it's misleading. Uh, the church is not spiritual Israel. Um, there is within the church those who are the Israel of God, true believers who also uh, trust in the Lord Jesus. But we shouldn't use a non-biblical statement like that because it simply confuses people all right so then we come to the name jew what is a jew well it's simply the shortened form of judah and once again things you know whenever people sin they complicate things and so uh initially um judah which was the royal tribe the leader tribe um they dominated when coming into the land, they led, led the armies and they defeated the foes. And of course, they sort of uh, uh, took some of Benjamin's territory when Jerusalem became the capital city. Jerusalem was actually in the tribe of Benjamin, but uh, Judah uh, sort of added that little piece to themselves. And Jerusalem became not only the capital of Israel, but it, to, to a large degree, was the capital of Judah. Well, then later, when the kingdom was divided, Israel became the northern section, and the southern section was known as Judah. And so uh, if you ask uh, modern Jews today, their assumption is that the northern tribes, 10 tribes that were taken off into captivity by the Assyrians some years before Judah fell, 
that they were scattered among the nations and they're the lost 10 tribes. And that the only people left who are identified with Abraham are in fact people from Judah or Benjamin and Judah with some priests from Levi. So they're saying that 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 Jew describes the people from Judah that actually all the others are lost. Now the scripture doesn't understand that. It doesn't say that at all. When when uh, Peter and James write to the Jewish believers who have been scattered across the empire, uh, they refer to them as the 12 tribes. And uh, and so the idea that these tribes have been lost, uh, that's not the case. There's a good little book on the subject by David Barron. David Barron was a rabbinical scholar, and David Barron wrote a book on the so-called lost 10 tribes. There are many false cults that have embraced this notion of so-called British Israelism. There's a whole branch of it down here, Black Judaism, and also um, the Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, and so on. These all uh, are working on the assumption that the lost 10 tribes, that we're actually the, the lost tribes, and we are laying claim to the blessings of Abraham because we are the lost tribes. And that's it's total ho hocus. There's no, there's no truth to that at all. All right, so... Um, so the term Jew now is simply used for anyone who uh, has their ancestry, not only to Abraham, but to Abraham through Jacob, because obviously there are um, people who came from Abram who were Arab tribes or Bedouin tribes and so on. And the same is true through Isaac, um, but through Jacob, uh, all of his boys uh, were part of what became the nation of Israel. All right, take a breath. Ah, good, all right. So number four, generally speaking, from Genesis 12 all the way through to Acts chapter two, there were just two divisions of the human race, the Jews and everybody else. And the term Gentile simply means the nations. In other words, everybody else. God said to Israel, I set you in the midst of the nations. And Israel was to be the vehicle of God's blessing to all the nations. In order to accomplish his purpose, God built a wall around the Jewish people. And that wall was designed with um, special festivals, special clothing, special kosher food laws, and of course, a special worship, special religious ceremonies, special priesthood. All of these things were designed so that Israel would be isolated. Now, this seems to be contradictory, right? To isolate them from the nations and yet use them as the means of spreading the gospel uh, of God to the whole world. <laughs> But to a large degree, this is true of the church as well. The church has been separated to God from the world, and yet at the same time is to be scattered among the world to reach them for the gospel's sake. And, and uh, this seeming contradiction is no contradiction at all. We, we realize that in order to live in this world, the Lord Jesus was... Uh, the friend of sinners. He ate with them. This man receives sinners and eats with them. And yet, on the other side, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. So there was a separation, and there should be a separation in our lives, that we are separated to God from the world, but at the same time, we are to be participating in reaching the world for Christ. Israel had the same situation. So they were supposed to be spreading the news of the true God around the world, but at the same time, they were to be marked off, to be separated. And this became one of the huge issues in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Solomon marries these foreign wives, and, and it brought his collapse, and God warned against this. This is the, the way of Balaam. This was Balaam's trick. If we can't curse the Jews, 
will get them to notice the pretty young Moabite girls. And when they want to have a relationship with these girls, their papa will say, listen, you're welcome for supper, but we have this little thing we do. <laughs> we, we offer some of the food to our idols. It's no big deal, but we'd like you to participate. And it wouldn't be long until these men, these Jewish men, would convert to paganism. And that's exactly what happened. And it wasn't just worshiping little sticks and stones. There were demons behind these. It was demon worshipers. And you can see that especially with Moloch and some of the others. Horrible things that came right out of the pit of hell. So this was an issue. This was a problem. And God was constantly calling his people back from um, uh, mingling with the Gentile nations. Now, on the other hand, some of the most exciting stories in the Bible have to do with the intermarriage of Jews and Gentiles. And I know this is complicated, but we have two stories of uh, uh, books written by uh, uh, named after women. And Ruth is the story of a Gentile who marries a wealthy Jew. And Esther is the story of a Jew who marries a Gentile. And the one is a picture of what has happened because the Jewish nation lost their spiritual interest. And God used Gentiles to bring the blessing back to the Jews. That's the first half of Romans 11. But then we discover that God is going to take away this role of being his representative in the world from the Gentiles, and he's going to give it back to the Jews. And with the rejection of Vashti and the acceptance of Esther, we have this drama played out, including Haman, who's the, the Antichrist, the beast image. <clears throat> we have this battle for the destruction of the Jews and their liberation. All right? So here we have this, what seems to be a dichotomy. On the one hand, um, the Jewish people are supposed to be an influence for God in the whole world. And on the other hand, um, they, are, they are to be separate. Now, we have this discussed a little later in the book of Ephesians, right? Where part of the work of Christ on the cross was to break down the middle wall of partition. This was a wall he built to separate off the Jews. And why? to protect the messianic line. If the Jews all dispersed among the Gentiles and all became demon worshipers, there was no hope for the world. But God had this faithful line all the way through the scripture. We see it showing up here and there, this faithful line of people who anticipated the coming of the Messiah. Once the Messiah came, there was now no necessity to keep that barrier. And, and so the Lord Jesus took down the middle wall and he made of two one, that is Jews and Gentiles brought together into a new society called the church. All right. So that's, that's how far we've got so far. We only have a few minutes left. The period from the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., until Christ's return is called the times of the Gentiles, right? And you see this in the book of Daniel, the transfer of the of God's influence directed into the world through Jerusalem. And then Babylon comes in and destroys Jerusalem. And we have this transfer to Babylon. And later on, Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome, and the times of the Gentiles continues, and in Luke 21, 24, the Lord says, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so this is a period of time uh, where God is primarily working through Gentiles and reaching out to the Jews, it's true, but he is primarily working through the Gentiles. And... Um, this period of time, called the times of the Gentiles, when it is fulfilled, Christ returns, and once again, the nation of Israel will become the center of God's attention and his, his control center, his, his place of rule, will once again be 
Jerusalem, where our Lord will reign. So, from Acts chapter 2 on, the human race is now described as being in three groupings. 1 Corinthians 10.32 refers to the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God. Now, the Church is composed of both Jews and Gentiles who have received Christ as their Savior and have been unified in him. All right. Now, all three of these groups are included in the overarching realm known as the kingdom of God. And there are many Christians who don't seem to grasp this. The kingdom is a mixture of both good and evil. We see this in the parable of uh, the harvest. The harvest is the end of the world. The angels come. They take the wheat. They separate the tares, right? Uh, the same is true about the dragnet, the good fish, the bad fish, the separating things out. So at the present time, the kingdom is this mixture. It will be established. The, the, that which is false will be separated out. And the kingdom, the kingdoms of the Gentiles will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and Christ will reign supreme. However, included in the kingdom is this faithful remnant of Jews, pictured by a treasure hidden in a field. Malachi says, they shall be mine in the day that I make up my jewels. And, uh, and then the, the pearl of great price, which is a picture of the church, the only precious gem whose value is not in, uh, increased by cleaving it. And, and so these are included in the reign of the Lord over, over everything, and yet they're very distinctive in God's purposes for them. So there is a future for Israel. But present-day Israel should not be confused with this, right? Uh, if you want a, a great illustration of this, you know, somebody says, this is so complicated, draw me a picture. Well, the best picture is in Leviticus 23, where we have the harvest festivals. The first one is the Passover. This clearly speaks of the death of Christ. Then we have um, the first fruits which speaks of the resurrection of Christ. And then we have Pentecost, which speaks of the birth of the church. Then we have the long harvest. And that's the period we're in at the present time. These were literally fulfilled, right? Christ literally died. People use literally for everything these days, but th these were literally fulfilled. And, uh, and, and now... There are still four that need to be fulfilled. Will they be fulfilled literally? No reason to believe they won't be. What are those four? Well, first of all, there is the, the trumpets, the recalling of Israel, largely in unbelief, back to the land. Then there is the Day of Atonement. Not only that Israel would come back to the land, but they'd come back to the Lord. And there's going to be a time of national repentance and restoration. And then we have um, this wonderful picture the, uh, of, of the millennium, the Feast of Tabernacles. The tabernacle of God is with men again, and he will dwell with them and be their God, and He will be his, they will be his people. And so that's all pictured for us so that we understand where we are in God's schedule. So our time is up, um, but I just leave that with you. And uh, as far as what's happening in the Middle East today, what we're seeing there, uh, we should remember the majority of the Christians in the Middle East are Arab background. They're not, not Jews. There are some Jewish believers, thank the Lord for that, actively engaged. I've had the privilege of sitting down at the Lord's Supper with Jews and Arabs together in the Lord. When the Jews go through difficult times, the Arab believers send them words of encouragement, have conferences for them to encourage them and vice versa. And so uh, it's a wonderful thing to see the work of God going on in the Middle East, um, Jews and Gentiles together. And there's some godly Jewish brothers there, 
uh, and sisters and, and godly uh, uh, Arab brothers and sisters and the wonderful work that God is doing there. And that's what we realize that behind all of this, we understand there are cosmic issues at stake. Satan has never given up on his desire to eradicate the Jewish people. And when people say, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free, what they're really saying is, we want the eradication of the nation of Israel. We want the Jews gone. And uh, this has been a long, there's been a long history of this. At the end of the Nazi regime, many of these Nazis went to Egypt and under Nasser with the Arab League, they taught the Arabs how to destroy the Jews. And this whole situation in Gaza was designed to cause an overreaction on the part of Israel to rob from them any um, any acceptance or any standing they might have in the international community, because Israel makes a really good David, but a really crummy Goliath. And so that was the whole intention of this, to, to cause this overreaction. How are the Jews to, to fight when they're, when they're so hampered by this? And this use of a sledgehammer to try and kill a mosquito uh, has led largely all across the world, this rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli um, fury. So we realize that we don't want to think that the nation of Israel today is the same thing as the nation of Israel in ancient days. But we also recognize that God is still seeking to save the Jewish people, and he is doing a work. But there is going to be another group. The ones who are saved today become part of the church. But there's going to be another group of people who do not accept Jesus as their Messiah, but are looking for the Messiah. They are looking to Jehovah to rescue them. And when he does, to their awe, to their utter amazement, they will discover he was wounded for our transgressions. They'll recognize that the that the Messiah they've been waiting for is the Jesus they crucified. And the Lord will save them, and he will restore them. So I hope some of that's been helpful. We're going to take a little uh, maybe clearer, simpler overview of our study next week. Um, but I just leave that with you in our next session. But I just leave that with you. I hope that's been helpful. And if only we can grasp the idea that... Um, uh, when we come to Hebrews 11, <laughs> God wanted to use the Jews to reach the Gentiles. But instead, because the Jewish nation rejected him, God used the Gentiles to reach the Jews. And we'll see that next in our next study, this remarkable way that God in his sovereignty has overruled man's stupidity to bring blessing to us in spite of himself. May the Lord bless you. Let's just pause for a moment's prayer. Father, as we think about these things, we realize that, that uh, these subjects are near and dear to your heart. Uh, you have always desired to have a people for yourself. And we see quite clearly these two threads that run through the scripture, that, uh, that uh, Jehovah God is seeking a wife who will be loyal to him. And Christ has come to win for himself a bride. And, and as we see how this is unfolding in the history of the world, we're amazed that you haven't given up, that you haven't discarded your plan, but that you in your final uh, triumph will see the Lord Jesus seated on the throne of glory, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God, and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you will unite every believing heart in one around the Lord Jesus. And so we look forward to that day and pray that in the meantime, we may lift him up to Jew and Gentile to preach the gospel, as Paul would say uh, to the elders at Miletus, um, to both Jew and Gentile to preach repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We commit this 
gathering of believers in Heidelberg to you for their rich blessing. And we ask uh, all of these things, not because we deserve them, but because we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much. Sorry for the, the glitch at the beginning. I hope the Lord will bless you in the coming week and encourage your heart as we think through this rather challenging subject.